This is the Bouquet Toss, a wedding planning podcast brought to you by thebudgetsavvybride.com to help you decide what to keep and what to toss from your wedding day plans. Welcome back to the Bouquet Toss. Once the major details are in place for your wedding day, there are some other logistics you'll need to organize, like hotel room block reservations, group transportation, or even seating charts. If you're working with a limited budget, you may not be spending as much money or time on these details, but they're still important to consider since they could affect your guests. In this episode, we'll help you organize your wedding logistics from where you'll stay on your wedding night to how you'll get to and from the celebration. All right, let's get into it. So as always, we're looking for a savvy take on this, right? I think a big thing to figure out right away is going to be accommodations. This is probably something you're already thinking about when you're picking your venue, right? At least we hope, right? We're thinking about the logistics of how you'll get there, where you're, where you're going to stay, but then also all of the guests if you are having them. You know, you're already probably looking at all of these things, including that venue, trying to get the best price for it. Accommodations are the same thing. You want to get your guests the best price on where they're going to have to stay. So there's a lot of different sites you can use like hotelplanner.com. We've got some resources on the blog as well that talk about what it looks like to find and reserve a block of rooms for the best price at a location or a few locations that are near the wedding venue. Yeah, actually, we have um, a special offer on the blog from Hotel Planner that can save you, I think, $25 $25 off your first reservation made through the platform. And so that's actually a link that you can share with your guests as well. So we'll be sure to include that in the episode blog posts for this episode. That's super cool. So you basically provide that link to anybody that is maybe looking to book a hotel for, you know, your wedding, and then they're able to book through that link. Yes. Amazing. Yeah. I think that's so important, just like making it easier for people I think your guests really appreciate when you've been able to like provide them something that's super easy to work with and just be like, hey, just use this link if you need somewhere to stay. It's also a great thing to be putting on your wedding website, like the options that people have for accommodations. Putting together like a hotel room block is something that might be foreign to a lot of people, but essentially you're just trying to make life easier on your guests, especially the people who are traveling from out of town. And so, you know, basically if you're not familiar with like a hotel room block, the hotel will provide, you know, a certain number of rooms allocated for your wedding guests, which is especially helpful if you're getting married on like a busy weekend in your wedding location, just to make sure that like rooms don't sell out and your guests have a place to book and stay. And often they'll get like a special rate included in that, maybe a slight discount from what the standard rate is, since you're basically providing them with somewhat of a guarantee of a certain number of rooms. There are some things to keep in mind with like hotel room blocks and stuff like that, but that's like a whole other long conversation. So we'll also include a link to a blog post that has all of those important details to keep in mind. Perfect. So when you are looking at potentially getting a room block, location is the thing that's really most important, right? Choosing a hotel that's convenient to your wedding location You just, you don't want to have to be providing people with a whole long list of complicated directions on how to get somewhere. It's so convenient. A lot of times when hotels offer like a shuttle or like a bus that will bring your guests, you know, like right from the hotel lobby to your venue, that's a pretty common thing. And it makes it just so much easier than having to tell all these people like, you know, here's how you get to the hotel, but then here's all the different twists and turns that you need to take to get to the venue. Yeah. So we'll actually be talking a little bit more about transportation later in the episode to give you some ideas on like things you could do for that. If, if it's not so simple. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And then I think another really great savvy option is to offer multiple places that people can stay. Because if you think about it from your perspective, 
you know, you would probably feel more comfortable knowing that you have options. Like maybe there's a higher cost option, but then there's a lower cost option, or maybe there's three and there's even like a middle ground. And then that way you can be providing that information. And then it's up to your guests to be able to choose what they feel comfortable spending rather than like making it feel like you're forcing them to like the only place to say is this like really expensive place sorry, that's the only option, you know? Right. And like, there are some other logistical things to like, keep in mind, such as, you know, if you are providing transportation, like a shuttle or some sort of service to get your guests from specific hotels where you have a room block, that is definitely a reason why your guests would want to choose the hotels that you have identified. But they also may choose to go their own way and pick something completely off you know, off list going rogue from what you've um, selected. So, you know, if that's the case, then, you know, they can get themselves to that hotel if they want to take the shuttle or, or whatever the case might be. But the thing is, is that you are doing something to try to make their lives easier. So I think it's always appreciated, but just know that your guests are going to do what they want to do. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But checking the policies that the hotel room box have is like a really, really important thing to do because some places require you to put a deposit down to hold a certain number of rooms. Some don't, you know, you have to really read the fine print, but if you are making the effort to kind of make sure that the amount of rooms are available for people that might be looking into it, then if you put a larger number than you end up needing, you could get stuck having to pay for the unreserved rooms, which would be a very not savvy thing to not have savvy done. At all. <laughs> <laughs> I think a great way is to like collect the information as early as you kind of can from your guests of like who thinks they're going to need a place to say, you know, and ask if you are going to need a place to say, do you want us to help you figure that out or are you comfortable doing that on your own? Right. And while it might not be as common for policies like this to be in place where you would be responsible for the deposit, again, it's super important to just ask the questions, read all the fine print to make sure that you're in the clear. But I think that's one of the benefits of using a site like Hotel Planner to sort that out because you're not on the hook for those unsold, unbooked rooms. Ultimately, there's an app or a website or something out there for pretty much everything at this point, right? <laughs> so of course, there's a hotel planner type of situation that can help you do this too. I think the savviest thing you can do is actually look for research and then utilize these resources that are there to help you make all of this easier for you. Yeah, for sure. And then there's also some perks that you know you might be able to score for your guests when you book a hotel room block, whether it's like free breakfast or a waived parking fee, if they normally have a valet fee or things like that. There's also potentially, I know I've heard of some hotels, if you have a certain number of rooms that they would give the couple getting married a free room for the wedding night. So that's something to ask for. Never hurts to ask. Not every hotel is going to offer perks like this, but it never hurts to ask. They just might. And if you don't ask, you won't receive. Exactly. So when it comes to accommodations, there's really kind of three levels that you're thinking about, right? It's you and your spouse, the couple. There's the wedding party who are, don't forget people that if they are coming from out of town and you are doing things like a rehearsal dinner or a day after brunch, they have to factor in a longer stay. And then there's your family and friends that are potentially coming from out of town if they are who might be saying just for the wedding night or maybe two nights or something like that. One thing that couples have to kind of figure out right away is like, do we feel like we want to be together the night before? Do we want to be in our parents' homes? Or do we have somewhere near the place to stay? There's a lot to think about in that way. And then also, you know, the same thing, like if your bridal party is going to be with you getting ready, getting their hair and makeup done, in the morning at the same time, where will they have been the night before? Kind of like getting ahead of those logistics, I think might even affect where you end up picking your venue. If you have a lot of people that are gonna be coming from out of town, sometimes like everyone's coming from out of town because of the location that you end up picking, which is totally fine, but it does mean there's like that extra layer of accommodation that needs to be figured out. 
which again is why like room blocks are such a great idea. There's also the ability, like if you have everybody in the same place, you can do some extra fun things like potentially deliver gift bags to all the guests that are staying, you know, a little like nice little bag with like a water or like a, you know, survival kit, some Advil, some chips, like some fun little things, or you could do anything that you wanted, but that's like another way to make it feel extra special. And there's also the ability to potentially have like an after party situation at the hotel. So potentially like everyone comes back because most of the people are already staying there. Then like you can kind of still party a little bit into the night. So there are some cool things that choosing a hotel block and like a central place can really do to like make the weekend even more fun. Yeah, it can enhance and extend the celebration for sure. And especially, you know, like you mentioned, if you have a lot of guests coming from out of town, maybe you, your family's spread all over the place and they don't get to see each other very often. And if everyone is staying in the same hotel, that gives more opportunity for those connections and those meaningful moments, which of course is like our favorite part of the wedding celebration. So what a good point. So to facilitate those awesome, you know, experiences and moments between your family members and your guests and your friends, there's a lot of different types of wedding transportation that's available. So we're going to talk through just like some of them, obviously they vary in price and this will all be things that you'll have to factor into your budget, but some cool ideas for wedding transportation. Yeah. I think first, like asking yourself, is this even a necessary expense for us, right? Depending on the location of your venue and the proximity to your hotel, you might not need to offer this. You might not feel compelled or obligated. You should never feel obligated. Let's, let's scratch that. But it may or may not feel more necessary <laughs> or courteous to offer transportation to your guests, depending on how far away the venue is from your hotel. I've been to a few weddings where the closest overnight accommodations were 30 minutes or more away from the location where the wedding was taking place. And those couples did provide transportation. You know, I've been on a school bus before to get to a wedding. I've been on a hotel shuttle. I've been in almost like a public transportation sort of uh, like trolley style situation to get to weddings before. So I think these are all like really cool and different options you can consider and obviously hit like a number of different price points as well. Ultimately, it may or may not be necessary for you to provide transportation for your guests, but if you are going to, we have options for you. <laughs> yes. So you mentioned a few already. A school bus is honestly a pretty common thing for people to use. Um, it's definitely one of the more budget conscious options for you. But if you are trying to get a large number of people from one place to another, it's a simple way to do it. Um, a charter bus or like a coach bus is another kind of like more upscale version of that. Definitely, it'll be a little bit pricier, but um, can feel a little bit more comfy. Then even further than that, you could do like a party bus or, you know, something where there's not just like the seats in rows, but people can kind of get up and mingle party <laughs> and mingle for lack of a better word party. <laughs> um, then there's also like probably the next step up from there would be like a limo or like a town car and potentially like, you know, based on the size of the group, you might need more than one. Um, so again, these are things that can add to the price, but it also makes for a really fun experience. Like when else are you getting into a limo to go somewhere, right? This could be one of those things that you're like, I really picture all of my bridal party and me and my future spouse getting in a limo and sipping champagne on the way from the ceremony to the reception or something like that. And if you do, great, put it in the budget. I also think thinking about the local place that you're in is important. You mentioned the trolley. That's some places like probably like San Francisco, right? They mm -hmm. have like a cool trolley experience. And I just keep thinking about marriage or mortgage when there was that one episode where like the decision about the trolley was like this huge thing, and, <laughs> but it was very expensive to be able to do it, right? Mm -hmm. And in a lot of cases, 
that might not even be part of the experience. I think also it's another reason why having a double, like a one location for your ceremony and your reception is advantageous because if everyone's only going there once, a lot of people will probably want to just do an Uber or a Lyft or like a rideshare type of situation. These days, that's so normal. People are so accustomed to doing that. And if they do plan on drinking and they don't want to have to be driving at the end of the night, that's likely what they're considering anyway. And similar to like a room block, you can often get like a specific code and like a special rate for people that use your code for like Uber or Lyft. You know, you can include the little card or something. Maybe it has a QR code or like there's just just a little promo code and you can put it in your wedding invitation or on your website. And then you can get like a group rate kind of discount because so many people will be calling Ubers or Lyfts or whatever it is for use of getting to your wedding. Yeah, for sure. I think the safety portion is a big factor for a lot of couples just because if you are having alcohol your wedding you want to make sure everyone gets home safely and so providing them with you know a reliable safe ride to get them back to their hotels is definitely one of the major like pros in the column for providing transportation for your guests another thing also i think is important to keep in mind is if your venue doesn't have a lot of parking on site providing transportation to get them there is also a benefit because if you're having your wedding somewhere like downtown or maybe even somewhere rural where they just don't have adequate parking or maybe it's like a gravel field and you don't want people to have to deal with that then those are cases where it might make more sense to actually have this expense and provide that for your guests yeah I think that's such a good way to think about it it's really an expense, like it's an item that you have to determine if it's worth it based on where you're actually doing the thing, right? And I agree that like the safety thing is probably the most important. Like if you know that you're providing an open bar or even just providing alcohol at all, you have to have a way to make sure people are getting home safe, right? And I think the key is making it as easy as possible and thinking ahead because you know, the same way that for a room block, you might have to have people schedule rooms way in advance because there's like a big sporting event or something going on in that area that same weekend. Then think about it. A lot of people are going to be calling Ubers and Lyfts at the same time. And so you don't want to be like leaving your guests stuck being like, oh my God, like I have to wait an hour to get somebody to come pick me up or like, you know, just thinking about like what the actual scenario will be for each person at that time and what's going to be easiest for them to like also have a stress-free experience. Yeah. Like, you don't want to leave anyone with like nightmares of your wedding. <laughs> yeah. Like, like it'll be fine, but good luck getting there and home. Like, no. Yeah. That's such a good point. It's such a good point. Don't leave them to fend for themselves on a busy like football weekend <laughs> somewhere. Right. Yeah totally makes sense we love anything that can help make wedding planning more fun and less stressful and that's why greenvelope is a game changer with over 7,000 five-star reviews and counting it's clear why so many people agree greenvelope's online wedding invitations are easy on your budget while sacrificing nothing when it comes to style or quality They have thousands of beautiful designs for everything wedding related, from engagement announcements to save the dates to formal wedding invitations, thank yous, and beyond. Plus, there are features galore to simplify your wedding RSVP process. Guests can RSVP with the click of a button, so you'll know in an instant which guests will be attending. And you can even include survey questions to ask guests about meal preferences, accommodations, and more. Greenvelope also makes communication with your guests stress-free. With their messaging center, you can keep in contact with your guest list at all times, whether you need to follow up or pivot your plans. Another thing we love is that Greenvelope ensures that your wedding invites won't just save trees, but that they will help build a sustainable future through partnerships with organizations like the National Forest Foundation and 1% for the Planet. There is no need to wait. Visit Greenvelope today by going to greenvelope.com slash BSB. The planet will thank you and so will your bank account. So I think we've covered 
transportation. And again, we'll include some links to other resources on the website that you can get further advice and information on this. But we're going to move on to seating charts, which is another kind of logistical detail that couples stress about, right? Because you're having to decide like who sits next to who and these two family members don't get along and who do you put where and who's going to get their feelings hurt. And I understand there's so much stress involved in these sorts of decisions, especially when like personal dynamics are involved, but it will make the day of so much simpler if you do the work ahead of time and figure it out for your guests, because having assigned seeds so they know exactly where to go helps them avoid any of those like awkward interactions like, oh, can I sit here or is this seat taken or like, oh, that table's full and there's no more chairs, you know. Telling people exactly where to go, like, gives them clarity and helps clear up any confusion or cluster of people gathering around, you know, any particular area as they enter your reception space. So, yeah, I think I'm I think I'm pro seating chart. I didn't used to be, but I I feel like I am now more so. We talk about like decision fatigue for the couple all the time. This is a definitely a spot where they have to do the work ahead of time, but then the decision fatigue doesn't exist for the guests. It makes everything I do agree with you. Like there's just a level of less chaos that you're gonna experience when it's just like, hey, this is where you're sitting. And I have some cool, savvy ideas where this is concerned. So you might be thinking like, oh, if I do a seating chart, then I have to do escort cards and now I'm adding another expense. But there's some really cool budget savvy ways that you can do this that don't involve an extra cost. So one, I'm going to share my friend did this and I thought it was awesome. So she didn't actually have a bridal party, quote unquote, but she had specific best girlfriends who were in charge of seating people as they showed up. Hmm. So they just had their own like clipboards with lists of where people were supposed to sit. And you came in and it was like fun because like they greeted you. They were like super nice. I love your dress. Like, you know, talking to you. And then they were like, let me show you to where you're going to be sitting. And then once you were at that table, it wasn't like you had to sit in one specific seat. It was just like, this is your table have at it Mm -hmm. um but it was like a cool like extra touch point with people that were close to the bride and groom there was like really no expense there at all like she truly just wrote out the seating chart and gave it to four different people and then said hey like can this be something you're in charge of I love that idea I think that's so unique and also like doesn't it kind of give your guests like a VIP experience like oh yes you're on the list let me show you where your seat is you know what I mean like I love that definitely yeah it was I really did enjoy it it was really nice and like it just kind of felt even more intimate to have you know someone being like we know exactly where you're supposed to be like you're supposed to be here thank you for being here you know that type of thing it was really nice I love that another thing that you can do is have It's really easy to make. I've seen a lot of people do this with like an old mirror where they just have a mirror and they write in like marker the list of the tables, like table number one, and then the list of the people there. This could be maybe you have one that you're getting rid of or you've got an old one sitting around, you want to replace it. And all you will, you you know, thrift stores. Thrift it. And bonus points if you have somebody you're close to that has great handwriting because then they can make it look fantastic. Um, There's also cheap ways to even use like your Cricut machine. And if you have one, print out some fun decor to go around it or even print out everyone's name so they look professionally done. And by doing like one central chart, it's not as expensive as having to print individual things for every person. And then everyone has like a central place that they can just go, they can look, they can figure it out. If there's any questions, they can refer to it after. Um, I think that's always a a cool way to go. I love that. We see a lot of that, I think, in our Real Weddings features. It's like a very distinct trend, like the acrylic signage or mirrors that you can either, like you mentioned, like write on with chalk ink markers, which is the the material I recommend if you're going to write. They do amazingly on those like flat surfaces. Um, And then you can easily like wipe them off when you're done and, you know, use that mirror in your home or whatever. But also the Cricut machine, the holy grail of DIY brides everywhere. (laughs) Like, 
<laughs> that thing will get a lot of use if you um, if you want to personalize things like like the seating charts. I love that. Yeah. So if you are trying to make a seating chart, I imagine this is not a skill that is inherently in every single person already. What are some ways that you can like tools you can use or things that will help you other than just like getting out a notebook and trying to draw it yourself? Right. I mean, you can do the old fashioned pen and paper way. And I've seen a lot of people like to use like the little flag post-it notes that you would use to like mark in, you know, your textbook when you were like cramming for exams. Um, (laughs) But they would use those and like write the names on them. And then it makes it easy to like kind of stick and move them around if you have, you know, your moving people to different tables to try to get just the right orientation. But there's also some really great techie online tools that you can use. One that is pretty well known within the wedding industry is called All Seated. And it's used by, you know, wedding planners, caterers, venue owners, and stuff like that to help do these seating charts, you know, for their clients. But as a couple, as a savvy, you know, bride and or groom to be, you can actually register for free for All Seated as a host and plan out your own event. You actually, I think, get up to 10 events free when you sign up. And so you can actually import your guest list. You can set the dimensions of your room and use like interactive tools to plan out the seating chart for your reception in a way that really keeps the true dimensions of your space in mind. So that's really helpful because it's realistic. That's awesome. That's such a good resource to use. You know, as we've been talking about this, I know you came to the realization of being pro seating chart, right? And I definitely have two. And also just even thinking about how that could relate to other parts of your wedding. And really that goes back to all of what we're talking about in this episode with logistics is like, that is one of the things that like, as the party throwers makes a real difference. I feel like it's one of those things that can set your wedding apart. It can make the experience that much more elevated just by having, having put in the time, you know, to make those things happen, to have had the forethought to really think of every possible scenario and make sure that your guests feel covered and like they're going to not have to worry too much on that day. It's one of those less tied to budget and more just tied to like thought and time, which is also a valuable resource just as your money is, but being savvy with it and really thinking about this just mostly because of how it will affect your guests experience, I think is super important. It's such an easy way for you to delight these people. Yes. You know, they always talk about like the sign of a good brand is like surprising and delighting its customers. And I think you can kind of apply that same principle to like your wedding planning. And when you're considering your priorities, not that not that there are right and wrong priorities to have everyone's priorities are their own. But considering your guest experience, I think is always an important factor to keep in mind when you're kind of setting those priorities and allocating your budget. Yeah. The other thing that's making me think about too is when you get to this point in the process and you're really having to think like, okay, if I'm providing this type of reception and I need this type of accommodations, can we do that within our budget? Spoiler alert, you always can. There will always be a way you can do it. But is that how you want to spend your money? Maybe not. And so that might be the thing that makes you realize maybe we don't want to do such a formal type of situation. Maybe we want something that has less logistics involved. Maybe that is going to feel better for us as the couple throwing this event. You know, I think that's that's like a really big part of ultimately your vision for the entire wedding is what kinds of accommodations you're going to need to be providing for the people that you're inviting. For sure. You just want to make sure that your guests feel appreciated and valued for being there to celebrate with you. That sound means it's time for Wedding Watch, a segment of the Bouquet Toss where we discuss iconic wedding moments from our favorite TV shows and movies. If you want to hit pause and watch the clip we're talking about today, head to our Wedding Watch playlist on YouTube. The link is in the show notes. This week's Wedding Watch is Schitt's Creek. I love this show so much. Me too. We were just talking about how we need to watch it all again. 
And I think that needs to happen. Apparently it's going to be coming off of Netflix. So. What? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Definitely need to make that a priority. I have to admit this show, like, I feel like I, I suffered through the first season. Like I wasn't really getting it. And then I feel like in maybe season two at some point, like it clicked for me. Same. I tried really hard to watch it and I just could not. And I had a friend who was like, no, 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 no. You must stick with it. It's like exactly your humor. You're going to love it. But I was like, but I can't even like make it through (laughs) these episodes. Like, I don't know what to do. And so then I don't even know how, but like, finally she was just like, I think like you really just need to trust me. And I fell in love with it. I think it probably speaks to like the character evolution, right? Because they were not likable people at the beginning of the show, but by the end, you just love them so much and they've grown in so many ways. That is very true. Ugh, I love it. I can't wait to watch it again. And like with that knowledge, like experience the first seasons, you know what I mean? Again, yeah. it's interesting. That's a good point. Anyway, <laughs> a little bit of Alexis. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of Alexis, she performed your number one wedding faux pas, which was wearing white to somebody else's wedding. I mean, I'm guessing that David okayed that. I think he was just kind of like, I don't care anymore. I mean, to be fair, his mother also wore white to the wedding and she was the efficient. She was dressed like the Pope. (laughs) That hat was so ridiculous with like the hair like wrapped around like the crown, I guess, of the hat. I I read like an article about how that was like a huge thing for the production team to figure out. They were not sure how to get this look that she was looking for and eventually they finally were able to like make a hair donut (laughs) that's exactly what it looked like a hair donut yeah yeah with a pope hat coming out the top and it's so ridiculous yet such a heartfelt moment oh we should also add it is the finale of the entire series yes like the wedding episode spoiler alert if you haven't watched the show (laughs) right so there's just built-in emotion because of that and you can kind of tell that they're really feeling like the weight of the show ending. But there's just so much about this, like the way they pulled off this wedding that I love. I think right away, if we're going to try to do this on the savvy scale, it actually is pretty savvy because like the whole premise of the show is that they don't have any money anymore. Although by this point, David's like running his own business and his partner has a job and whatever. But I think that like the intentions of being as savvy as possible are there. And the funniest part is they forego getting a tent, even though it's an outdoor wedding, because they would rather put their money towards the pizza oven. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I would love your take on this because it's something we talk about. Like, yes, like if, if the pizza oven is more important to you, put your money towards that. But is like the safety contingency of having a tent because you cannot trust the weather more important and more savvy? (laughs) Yeah, this is a question where like you have to look at the practical implications of your priorities, I think. Uh, But in the end, it didn't turn out to be a disaster, right? Like the whole like town rallies together and helps them come up with plan B. It's like torrential downpour. And so like an outdoor wedding is not a possibility. And so the entire town like rallies together to pull off David's vision, but like inside. Mm -hmm. And which is also like a pretty savvy thing, like employing the community to help you pull it off. I think it's a testament to the people and how much they cared about them as a couple and like their celebration. Can't always rely on that in every circumstance. Um, Yeah. So it's important to think about like the practical aspects and like plan accordingly for those for sure sure I mean also I think that by this time in the series the characters have learned that money is not the end all be all Mm -hmm. so the wedding is evident of that that you know like a display of like all the fanciest things which is what the Rose family would have had prior to ever coming to Schitt's Creek they've like moved past that and it really shows with David's relationship that him and his husband are just so deeply in love. And like, that is what matters. Right. Yeah. I think, you know, for one thing, they are getting married in this 
podunk town, right? Like that's the whole <laughs> premise of the show, Schitt's Creek, um, which is obviously not a major metropolitan area. So we can assume that they're able to do things like pretty affordably based on the location. But at the same time, like you see these like ornate, like floral installations, like they have like a flower chandelier and flower ca- uh, columns at the altar and like all this stuff. But if that's really like the whole focus of like their decor budget, it could have still been done reasonably affordably, maybe. So, but of course it's, you know, the whole Hollywood, like movie TV magic, you have to kind of suspend reality (laughs) when, when costs are concerned, but. I really want to believe that David pulled off this elevated, expensive look on his budget. Yeah. I want to to believe that too. (laughs) We're going to believe that because we think it's possible. Yes. Another thing I loved about this was obviously they wrote their own vows. And I feel like in any other context, like it would be cringy for someone to start singing acapella in the middle of their (laughs) wedding vows. But for some reason in this show, it was just so charming and like heartwarming to me. (laughs) Yeah. Patrick sings Mariah Carey, like always be my baby. (laughs) I, yeah, I read an article too about that, that they like got express permission from her. Wow. And then they did a cast reunion during the pandemic over Zoom, and she surprised them and came in the Zoom. Oh my gosh, I have like chills. <laughs> yeah, so ultimately, I think we're going to give this a pretty high savvy scale rating. I'm not giving it a number because there's so many things that are contingent on like small details that we can't actually prove happened. But I would say pretty savvy. I think also the fact that they really mostly had people that were not out of towners coming, like it was basically people that lived there, Mm -hmm. um, was a very big savings. Yeah, like no one from their former lives even like showed up for this wedding. So Right. It puts that in context too for people, I think, like about the people who are showing up for you in your current life and not just people who you've known for a really long time. That is such a good point. Truly, this is a wedding evident of the people in their lives right then and there that are supporting their marriage and also like were there for the entire relationship to unfold. Like that is who was there, nobody else. Mm -hmm. I love that. These are all great things to think about. Thank you, Schitt's Creek, for the inspiration. And we highly recommend this being anybody's excuse to go watch the entire (laughs) series. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Not just the last episode. 100%. Ew, David. And that concludes our weekly wedding watch. Want to hear us chat about one of your favorite scenes? DM us on Instagram and let us know what we need to watch and chat about on future episodes. Another big piece of logistics that you'll need to figure out before your big day is your day of wedding timeline. And this is... Obviously, the schedule of events that brings together all of these details that we've been obsessing over throughout the whole wedding planning process. So this is a whole conversation in itself. We're going to save this for an upcoming episode all about the big day. So stay tuned for that. You've been listening to The Bouquet Toss, a podcast brought to you by The Budget Savvy Bride. We would love for you to join us in our free private community to get support and inspiration from other couples currently planning their weddings too. Consider the bouquet tossed in your direction so you can rate, review, and subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app. As always, stay savvy and stay tuned for our next episode.